Welcome to Speaking of Seeing About Each Other with me, Sandy Robertson, and uh, with my compatriot, Bill Wadman over there. Uh, because everyone always tells me how mean I am to you, Bill, I, I wanted to ask you how you are today. Well, Bill, I'm fine, but gee, I wish I would say, how are you? <laughs> oh yeah, you did. How are you? Oh, how are you? <laughs> I'm okay, how are you? Totally outside my comfort zone in a Czech shirt, pretending to be Bill Woodman. Well, you know, sometimes being somebody else makes it easier to talk about things. And you, you look so much like the Sandy Robertson I recognize, what with your scarf and your cup of coffee. I need my knee up in the shot. I feel like half the time I talk to you, your knee is up in the shot. Is that not true? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so will I explain or shall you explain what we're doing? You can explain. I, you're, you're better at the explaining. Okay. So um, people watching who've maybe watched before will realize that Bill and I talk to each other really regularly and we always look at art together. Um, and I met Bill by being interested in his photographs and him kindly agreeing to uh, work with me on speaking of seeing project and in part sometimes being into my classroom um, and generally inspiring my students. Anyway, speaking of seeing tonight is speaking of seeing about each other. And um, though it says on there a conversation with Bill Wadman, it really should say a conversation with Bill Wadman as Sandy Robertson with Sandy Robertson as Bill Wardman, but I couldn't fit all of that on. Yeah, that's, so. that's, the, the font would be too small. <laughs> um, and what we've done is we've each selected two images by the other person. And we're gonna speak to the photographs as if we are the other person based on what we know. So I'm gonna start with an image that is by Bill. Yeah. So references to painting. <laughs> yep, a few of them in there. Yeah. Uh, and everything about the palette, the expressions and the light is like an ensemble Caravaggio. That's what I was going for. Um, and even things that are what may appear to be accidental are so vital in this photograph. So what I mean by that is things like the red diagonal strap of the bag that brings us into the painting and could be anything from the red diagonal strap of a crossbody bag. It could also be a musket holder or a I don't know, something. So I'm very aware that I could take it too far because one could see, I suppose, whatever one believes in a photograph. But I do think this is uh, not in any way accidental. Or if there is accident within the photograph, then it's a happy accident each time. I think I, I, think I am the man of many happy accidents. <laughs> um, I do think that there is an element of Judith in this, Judith beheading Holofernes. Yeah. Um, especially the character, and I'll call them all characters, um, on the far left of the image with the, the grey top. Yep. Uh, there's an element of the, the assistant, the maid, who looks away and holds the holds the head. In fact, Bill, I think you've actually seen a photograph in which I tried to recreate. Um, it was actually it's the head of John the Baptist. Yep. Um, and the way that the central character has his eyes raised aloft. Um, Aaron, uh, the, the, the main character there on the phone in this particular image, um, has a very something about the expressions on his face, just the way he is, he has the kind of body and expressions that definitely lends itself to this kind of work, you mm. know? 
uh, he himself is an artist, by the way. So I think when I said, this is how I want you to be in general, he was like, oh, like this? And I said, yep, that's exactly what I want. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Because the, re the real story of this, of this photograph is going to be less impressive than the story that you're weaving. I think perhaps. But keep going. I, I, I want to I know what else you see in it. Um, I do want to talk about the, the lights we see versus the light there is yep. and how useful that is as a device. Sure. Um, the directional light, of course, you know, all of this is about kind of a chiaroscuro, but I remember listening to you talking about your work and actually the work of someone you really, really admired. Stéphane Lavoie or Lavoie. Stéphane Lavoie, yeah. Um, and how though it goes to darkness, it doesn't go to black. Yeah, he lets things go to like a dark gray. He he lifts the shadows up. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to me, there's there's not a blackness. There's not an inkiness in this. Yet there is a darkness. Yeah, I mean the shadows are are pulled down, but there's still detail in them most of the time. Yeah. Um, and I think what, what that does is it creates uh, an enormous feeling of um, warmth and intimacy, actually, for something that is a, is a group photograph. Yeah. Uh, also, I love the closeness, the physical proximity of all the characters. The, you know, they are squashed up. Yeah. Um, their expressions are fantastic and it makes me wonder about your abilities as a director <laughs> Wait, wonder about them in a negative way <laughs> like, <laughs> it makes, makes me wonder whether you have any abilities <laughs> as a director no, um, a yeah um yeah this 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 image was taken into there's a coffee shop on the ground floor of my house it's very friends I mean, if you walk out my front door there's a cafe on the corner and um, uh, Brent and Carolina, who are the people behind the counter, are the couple who owned the cafe called the Red Horse Cafe back in the day. It closed, I don't know, five years ago or so, although they live, still live in the neighborhood. And um, this was literally, I think, a week before they closed. And I said, I want to do a Caravaggio-esque shot of a bunch of people like at the counter being annoyed by one person who's taking too much time. Um, and that's my wife on the right, that's Heather on the right. Yeah. And, and Aaron's actually wearing, uh, Aaron, the main character in the middle is actually wearing Heather's scarf. That's Heather's scarf because I needed something around his neck. Um, and that's Heather's red bag that she always used to carry around when she was like uh, going down to the down to the, the store or whatever. The, the it, you know, uh, our friend uh, Derek in the middle with the knife, he actually was holding a fork. Um, and the fork just didn't read enough as like violent enough. Mm. So I swapped it out for a knife and post. And I recently tried to put the, the fork back in thinking I went too far. And then I kind of ended up liking the knife. I like, I, I flipped back and forth on it. Yeah, I mean, there's an edge of violence. I'm using quite soft sure. to talk about it, but of course, the uh, the red is bloody. <laughs> yeah, and and certainly, in if you were playing off of some sort of Caravaggio version of this, mm. there would be somebody who was being on the edge of violence because, you know, he himself was a violent man supposedly. Um, the thing I find really funny is that the older guy up in the right, uh, his name is Alan, and he lives. Him and his wife live around the corner from us, and since we took we didn't really know them at the time he just happened to be in the cafe and i said would you mind being in this photograph that we're setting up and he came in and he uh he's you know not an actor himself so you know i always wanted a little more out of him but now when i look at it i don't mind the fact that he's a little more dull because overall it would be too much if everyone was sort of active in it but what's funny about it is that he and his wife are now some of our best friends like we have mm -hmm. since have coffee with them on weekends and that kind of stuff. So it's it's funny seeing him here in a in a situation where I barely knew him and now he's a good friend of mine. Yeah. So the other uh, thing that I really notice about the well, I was just, actually no, I was just about to say I noticed about the painting. The thing I noticed about the photograph also is the are the hands. 
And um, I do think they are so important in this, you yeah. know, the way that um, every hand leads, every hand leads us to another part or element somehow of the story. Um, it's very directional. There's a real sense of kind of movement also, which is then about, um, <laughs> you know, we talk about photographs that are cinematic. It's like, well, Baroque paintings that are cinematic. There was no notion of cinema yet. There was a notion of theater, certainly. Yeah. This is theater. Yeah. It's interesting though that, can, can, I never thought this was a successful image. Like, I feel like I missed it on this one. As much as I like it, I always look at it and think of the ways I could have made it better. Were you disappointed when you saw that this is one of the ones I picked? No, I like this image, but it's one of those situations where I look at it and I think, oh, this could have been twice as good if I had changed X, Y, and Z, mm. you know? Like, I feel like it's a little too, linear left and right, just everyone stacked in a row where I probably would have made it a little more vertical or a little like more groupings or somehow. No, because um, I read a lot of depth actually in, um, though you're saying that Alan, you know, isn't an actor and you had wanted maybe a little bit more from him. Yeah. Uh, his position and his sort of, because of his height, gives a really good sense of depth. And the other thing is the sense of recession with the well, people behind the counter, yeah. Into the counter and then back again to the final character. Yeah. It's very clever, Bill. Well, I thought that the, it's, well, okay, two things. One, I thought that the light on this was pretty successful. Like this was kind of what I wanted to get light-wise. Um, although it's, it's funny and I know you're not a technical photographer and you don't care about these things, but like I shot this on my old Canon and those, it was probably a Mark III, I think, a 5D Mark III. Um, where those files, if you pull up the shadows too much, they get really yucky in a bad way. And I also look at this and I think, my God, if I had shot this with a better camera, I could have made the shadows even more dense in, in, a, in a good way. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's weird talking, looking at your own work. It's, it's also, what is this, like 10 years old? This is an old picture. Um, I don't know that I told any of these people to do any of these things in particular. I think I may have said, all right, Carolina, like, you know, you're making coffee and then just turn to your right. That kind of thing. He's but it certainly to... wasn't oh, no. Heather lift up your hand in this way, you know? Um, so some things end up just being somewhat serendipitous. I, you know, I took a, I took a group portrait uh, last, I guess it was last week in Puerto Rico of these seven women, these Puerto Rican women, all the way from like, I think they're nine-year-old girls to, you know, a 70-year-old woman. It was like of this real group of, of, of women. And whenever you're working with a, if all of these people were actors or models and I brought them in and we were really trying to make this totally particular and we could go back and look at the monitor and say, no, move your hand a little bit this way, you could get really sort of into it like that. But a lot of times when you're doing group pictures, you're never going to get the exact picture you want out of everyone in the group, you know, just, just, you can never get all of them at the elevated point at the same moment. It's very difficult to do. So it's like, you may like this one of the seven of them, but uh, this woman on the right, her face is a little turned or her smile is a little weird. Her eyes are a little squinty. So, so when I look at this. That you did alter this post-production, you put the knife there rather than the fork. I mean, did you change did. the other element? Uh, not that I can think of. I don't know. I'll dig up the raw file and send it to you so you can look at it. But uh, I definitely, I mean, the contrast is boosted and there's lots of, you know, curves all over the place like I do. Um, I also look at this from a post-production point of view and say, oh man, I would have done this so much better now. Uh, yeah, I mean, do you do you ever do that? Do you ever look at your work and, and not, it's not judging it Judging it with the skills and artists that you are now versus the artists and skills you had when you made it? Um, I, I don't think, uh, I mean, I don't accrue technical skill particularly. Yeah. 
But I mean, you must, there must be, you think your compositional instincts are the same as they were 10 years ago? Um, they're different, not because they're better. Yeah, they're just different. They just, I just go through phases. Yeah, it's funny because I tend to think, oh, I'm better at this now than I used to be. See, I, I would never be so bold, <laughs> even with myself. Because you, because you think that that is a improper thing to say or because it's, it's I don't know, too flashy or, or egotistical or something or because, flashy. say again? It is quite flashy, yeah. That, okay. that, again, you know, Bill, this is relative to the way I the way I see it, you know, I would say oh, that sure. I'm just, yeah, as I said, going through phases, I'm not, I'm not necessarily better. In fact, actually, you know, one of the most sobering things is, is to perhaps start to worry that one used to be an artist or a photographer. Um, and look back, yeah. you know, I look back at work I was making even at 17, 18, when I first started at art college and I was still painting a lot and drawing every day for example yep and i think oh my goodness where is that person gone where is that just that like the, the lack of practice what do you think that is um partly laziness yeah yeah um and that that is you know interchangeable for me with lack of practice because i'm when i'm not being lazy i get on and do things mm. it's yeah. Is that also it's, an element of complacency? You know, it's like it's like thinking, oh, I'm really good at this thing. Um, and then just thinking, well, I'm good at it, I'll always be good at it, and not paying it the right attention and waking up one morning and trying to do it again and realizing I can't. Yeah. yeah. You let you let it go too long and now you gotta start over again. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, I, oh, I know I can do pull-ups. And then after a <laughs> while, you can't do pull-ups anymore. And you're like, yeah. oh, shoot, doing a pull-up. I, yeah, it, um, yeah, yeah, I will look at an image like this and I had certain goals for it. This was also the beginning of a larger series of images that I tried to make of, um, I call them, they're like food. Is They're in a folder on my hard drive called food. Mm. And this was food zero, zero. This was like the prototype for the food stuff. In the same way that there, there's a picture of my wife in the backseat of a, a Chevy uh, convertible. Yep. Um, that was sort of the prototype for this Drabble series that I did. And so this was supposed to be the prototype for this food series. And I think I did five of them and then just hit a wall and didn't make any more. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where whenever I try to plan, I fail. It's always things I just fall into. And I tried to plan. But so you, are, you, are, you are discussing something here that I think most um, visual artists might sort of recognize as the sense of accumulating or, or, or the, the skill is cumulative. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think technical skill certainly is. Mm -hmm. And I think that your eyes grow over time. You know, it's interesting. I. I chose this one. Who was the who was the photographer we were looking at? I know I'm terrible at the names. Uh, the photographer, the hotel interiors we looked at a few weeks ago. Um, well, we were looking at Len Cohen, which in many yeah, ways could be smaller scale, and then the other one was Kendi de Hofer. Yeah, I think it was Lynn Cohen. I, were the earlier ones, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the one the 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 chairs you and I were going to sit down on and have conversations. At. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's, I think we talked a lot about like negative space in those images and how much negative space there was and how much they were additive because of the negative space, if, if I, if I recall correctly. Um, yeah, and when I, like additive and subtractive, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I saw this image in, in your feed, I just looked at it and I thought, this is a prime example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. The interesting thing is, is that like in your feed, most of those images don't have any people in them. And I'm not saying they should. I'm just saying that it's interesting that most of them don't and only a handful of them do. 
but sometimes I think the ones with the people on it were the most successful. Hmm. Like, I don't think this one would be as successful without that guy over there. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's just, he, you know, there's like this added, I think when we were talking about those other photographers, you know, you, that was the, that was the episode we discussed, like stories and narrative based in images. And if it was a, if it was a space, an interior devoid of people, you imagine people in that space. No. Um, no. You imagine people in that space before or after the picture was taken. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay. That, that's what I meant. Um, where I would generally just see it as the empty space. Uh, so it's interesting to me, were you about to take this shot and the guy walked in or was he standing there and you saw it and took the shot? He was actually walking back and forth. I, I don't know what he was doing. Um <laughs> He was in a suit, and this is in Tate Modern. Um, it was at the Annie Albers exhibition, which I've been really desperate to go to. I really like photographing inside galleries and libraries and, you know, sort of municipal buildings. I think that kind of thing really kind of thrills me. But and in then, some ways, all of those places you just listed are more like cerebrally public buildings. You know what I mean? Well, I like the idea of people that go to public places to be alone. Yes. Okay. That's fair. Like, I like that because often I go to public places to be alone. Um, and to voyeuristically watch other people doing the same? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, anyway, he was just so, it was something kind of amazing and incongruous about him. Uh <laughs> this might make sense you know a lot of lots of the exhibits are for free you just go in but this is a paid for exhibition so it's a bit quieter and again I really like sure. that anyway so even if I'm not particularly drawn to the artist I like going into the paid exhibitions or using my take card to get in and spending time uh yes looking at other people there who might be not the same as me that's not what I mean but perhaps engaging in a solo activity with no sense of shame about it and, and nobody looking at you like you're totally nuts or strange. do you feel a kin do you feel a kindredship with those people it's not it's not a, a kinship it's just uh It's, it's, it's a curiosity, maybe. But anyway, th this man was in his suit. He was walking back and forth against the yellow wall. And this image is a lazy image because, um, you know, you said to me before that if you get beautiful models, you know, it's an easy photograph. And I find that, you know, if I go somewhere like Tate, where the rooms are, it's an easy photograph for me. It's a lazy photograph. Look at all the mistakes in it. Look at the fact that he's not really in focus. Look at the fact that I haven't taken my diagonals out into the corners, which I do actually normally do quite deliberately. I like going diagonal into corners. Does the ceiling creeping in at the top bother you? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, you know, I am like the absolute antithesis of you in so many ways photographically. Yes, you are. Um. And also, do you know, the other thing for me is uh, I am obsessed with colour. And there's something so compelling about that yellow. And there's something so compelling about the yellow also because there is nothing else to balance it out. Yeah, I mean, this th if that wall was white, this image wouldn't work. It's like that yellow is what defines this picture. Yeah, I mean, it's like I was in Lyon in, in France a few years ago at Le Musée des Beaux-Arts in the centre of town and there was a cafe and it was closed but it had an orange wall. I obviously being me spent longer at, in the closed cafe taking photographs of the orange wall with the chairs than I did looking at any of the paintings. <laughs> now I am you know it sounds 
I don't know if it sounds contrived or something, but it's really not. I, I don't know why it is that I have such a, an incredible love for these extremely um, ordinary in so many ways, yet empty places. Yeah, but I mean, that guy, there's something about him and I think it's because he's in this black suit. So he ends up being sort of negative space himself in some ways. Like you look <laughs> at him, he's like a black hole over there, you know, uh, a black hole with a head on top. Yeah. You reminded me um, of a penguin. You're reminding you what? You reminded me of a penguin. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. That he himself is, I don't know how to put this. Um, I don't imagine him having a story. I have imagine him not having any story. I don't know if this will make any sense to you. When I was a wee girl, not so young actually, probably when I was just first a teenager maybe, and I was allowed to go out by myself with my friend. And we used to go to Byers Road in Glasgow and go into what was, I think at the time, Wimpy or Burger King. And um, we'd sit in the window and we'd be able to afford between us a milkshake and a portion of chips. And we'd sit there and we'd watch the world going by in the window. And um, I used to find it really disturbing. Like in most big cities, lots of people are lonely. Uh, and you'd see people coming in on their own to eat. Yep. And they were coming in, often it would be like we old ladies would come in and they'd be ordering like a cup of tea in a polystyrene cup and a, a teeny tiny portion of chips like the one that Alex and I had just ordered. And we just ordered it because we needed a reason to be inside. Sure. Uh, and I'd watch these three old women or old men, but definitely older and sort of uh, have this feeling of just like being quite disturbed at first but over a long period of time of encountering the same thing realizing there was something kind of um I don't know perfect about it <laughs> oh I sound like such a freak um what the 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 wee old lady with the styrofoam cup of tea was perfect yeah okay kind of replete yeah not anxious. Sure. You know, you well, I think resigned. <laughs> maybe, yeah, resigned. Yeah. I'm not I'm not saying there's a movement away from sadness. Or loneliness, you know. In fact, yeah. I, actually I am saying that it, it's this is loneliness. And maybe, you know, I, I don't think this man was with anyone else in the gallery. He could have been on his lunch break from work for all he we know. He could have been, and it's probably like you know, it's likely that it was there's a reason like that why he was dressed like this. Yeah. Um I don't always read too much into people, but uh definitely think that sort of that period of being still a girl and taking notice of those things, really watching them, sort of studying them. But I've always been quite quiet, really. And I've sort of maybe, I don't know if you were quiet as a child or if you've always been quite kind of extroverted. Probably. Um, I don't know if it gives you more space to just notice yeah, other I mean, things. The, the question I would have is, you know, you, you have this whole backstory of how you see people in contexts like this and therefore all of this sort of not baggage but like this backstory you have towards people like this man and when you look at this picture you have this this complete sort of body sense of what it means and what it represents um do you think that the image translates that to a viewer or do you think it's sort of the viewer gets to see it they do what they come up with what they want but they don't even know that this has this whole secret world inside my head when i look at this image well you know it does have a secret world inside my head of course but actually you know there's another secret world about this 
which is to do with its title and of it being part of the Annie Albers exhibition. But to me, it really doesn't matter what somebody else sees in the photograph, they're seeing something. And even if this photograph doesn't set the world on fire, let's face it, it hasn't. Uh, the fact is- Set my world on fire. That's uh, somebody somewhere seeing it has, has the authority, should they wish, to put into it what they feel. But anyway, it's called Suits for Annie. And I kind of loved that because there was something about respecting Annie Albers, who was married to Yosef Albers and they were at Black Mountain College together and they were kind of pioneering power couple. And you imagine that this guy put on this suit as a sign of respect for, go I'm going to go see your show, so therefore I'm going to get dolled up for it. I kind of felt that. I was like, that's okay. so cool that like somebody like Annie Albers, let's face facts. Like there's a, a renaissance now, which I really celebrate for like weaving, for example. She was a, she was a weaver, she was a warehouse mm -hmm. weaver. Um, like women artists, especially women artists who've worked in a, in a field that might be considered craft based, heaven forbid, you know, they're like cast out into the dump of history. <laughs> and Suits for Annie, you know, her work is pioneering the respect of it. I kind of love that idea. And also the fact that on the on the right, you've got what to me look like screens, as in printing screens. Which oh, I hadn't even thought of that, but yeah. But of course, the curator would be well aware of that. And I suspect that is deliberate, of course. It, the, the whole thing, you know, do what you want with it, really. <laughs> Ignore it. It's a good image. That, that, that yellow and the guy are just great. Well, cheers. <laughs> I have to drink it like you. Yeah, but is it as big as your head? No, this is the biggest one Bianca had at her house, so. Okay. I'm trying really hard not to belch out loud. How on earth do you consume Do me? it, do it, do it. Belch out loud. No, that, that is not... It's not, it's not the, proper. That, not the audience we're looking for, Bill. <laughs> anyway, I picked this one truthfully because I know that the last image you've picked of mine is uh, a self-portrait. I know from things you've mentioned to me in the past that you don't particularly like being in photographs. That's true. So this is not on your website. No, I don't know. Where'd you find this? Well, if you type in Bill Woodman to Google, yeah. a few versions of this come up eventually if you go through enough images. I must have used them as a profile picture somewhere. Well, there's, there's, quite, there's quite a few of them. But anyway, I like this idea of there being a Bill Woodman that is, uh, that is not colorful and noisy. And it's not because I in any way dislike the colorful, noisy Bill Woodman. <laughs> but I think this perhaps just showed me something different about you. And again, don't forget, before I, you know, before I knew you, all I knew of you really was through Dancers in Motion. Right. And um, which, 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 I, which I disappointed you on my explanation of. Yeah. Would, do, you, do you wish that there was more th that I had more romantic stories and thoughts behind my images? I mean, you, you, have, you have the things that you put into them. Does it, feel, does it take away, does it detract from those images to know that I don't see them with the same depth that you do? No. Okay. It, it maybe did at the time. I was quite, had to, I don't know, it's again, it sounds so weird. I had to kind of come to terms with the fact that you didn't. The, the bill that really is versus the bill I thought existed. 
Um, but anyway, he, I, I find this self-portrait to be something that is uh, also maybe, again, this is me reading into things, but knowing you a bit better now, and I, I don't think it's a secret, you know, lots of people who've watched us talking before have heard you being very frank, very open, very generous with um, your story, uh, who you are and what things that you've experienced or encountered. And I do wonder about the kind of, um, when one is not feeling totally buoyant and jolly, because of course, you know, you're a master of illusion. And I think this, yeah, yeah, but this maybe shows something, it shows something of you that is not about, uh, um, the spectacle of it. Now, it's a technical exercise. I know that. Yeah, I don't even remember taking this. Yeah. I mean, I vaguely remember taking it, but um, I had seen, there was, I, I, I saw someone else's work. There was a self-portrait by someone else like this, and I can't remember who it was. It was some, you know, big name, mid 20th century photographer person. Um, I'll have to find out. Who, I gotta figure out who it was, but I just wanted to figure out the technique. It's like, it's like a nor, it's like a shutter drag, like I did with motion. But there's something, there was something else with it that I have to remember exactly how I did it. Anyway, I just was playing around. It's interesting that you see depth in this. I see this as a really uncool person trying to look cool in a picture. That's okay. Uh, you know. Isn't it? Sometimes yeah. we're at our most vulnerable and revealing when we're really trying hard to be something. Yeah, because I am not cool. No. And so, <laughs> so um, when I look at images like this, like I don't think I look bad in a lot of pictures. Like I think I, I look okay in this picture, um, as blurry and smeary as I am. Um, but but but. I, you know, there, there are, there are the, there are the people who take self portraits. And this is a conversation I want to have with the, with the last photo of the evening. Um, in such a way where they're, they're leaving out or obfuscating themselves in order to elevate themselves in their own heads somehow um, that, you know, I made this picture because I saw some other picture of another artist that I thought where he looked cool. And I was like, can I make a thing where I look cool? Cause I'm not cool. But maybe if I use this weird smeary long exposure trick, I'll look cool and people will think I'm cool and they'll hire me cause they think I'm cool. Um, also, you know, there's again, no shame. In doing that? In doing that. There's also no shame in there being no meaning. I can't believe that's just come out of my mouth, but the fact <laughs> is, is that I know- yeah, Can we, can we roll that back please? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, I know that you like to work stuff out. And to such a large extent, you're a self-taught photographer. Yeah. You know, you do like to put the boot in a little bit about the fact that I'm not a self-taught photographer. I actually went to art college and studied photography. You know, 10 times more about photography than I do. And so I know that I know the bill who likes to unpick stuff to understand how it works. Yes. And so I think it's okay that that photograph might be this, but there is also then the other part, which is that Sandy Robertson came along and saw this or somebody else might come along and see this and might also begin to imagine that you can see something actually quite stark about Bill Woodman in this. Do you think that that was in it when I took it or do you think that that's inherent in the image and I was saying that without even knowing I was saying it? Or do you think that's just how you're reading it? No, I, I, both actually. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is a very, this is a very moody image. It's a very, um, we're, I'm a, we're overusing the word dark, but it's, a, I mean, it is very dark. I mean, the shades are very low, but 
um, it's a very uh, primitive maybe image uh, in the sense that the lighting isn't fancy. In fact, it's really just like a modeling light on a strobe pointed at me. Um, and it, it is uncontrolled in some way. You know, we're opening the shutter, I'm turning my head. I don't know exactly what I'm gonna get. Where I usually don't like things when I don't know exactly what I'm going to get. Um, so yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, this is very un-Bill Wadman of a Bill Wadman picture, especially an un-Bill Wadman picture of Bill Wadman. Mm. But, you know, can you not see also, can you see yourself in it? I have a hard time seeing myself at all. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, I can superficially. I've, I've, I mean, the larger question of, I mean, this is something I struggle with constantly, which is how I define myself, how I see myself, what my goals are. Like any, anything, if you, if you said describe myself, I don't know that I could easily do that. I know, but I always find it interesting when I talk to you that you do like notions of um, like limit. Like it somehow helps you to put a limit always on something. Oh, okay, yeah. And but, but funnily enough, this this portrait, no matter it might be your experiment, no matter it might be quite kind of basic, no matter it might be almost disingenuous. Nonetheless, there is, um, you know, Bill Woodman's in there, right? So you took it, sure. you're in it, we see something of you, we see something of what you want us to see, but we also start, of course, as we talk about all the time, making assumptions about you. There's a million other photographs that look like this. But it's not only one, one like this of me. Exactly. Sure. I'm going to start taking a lot more self portraits when I get my new camera because it'll make it a lot easier. No, I'm, I'm honestly going to. Um, it's on my list of things to do. It's okay. I didn't think you were lying, Bill. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very, I mean, the thing is, is that I, as a transition to the last image, I think it's interesting that I am fully expressed in this image, but blurry. Mm. where in your image and almost every public image of you we can't even see you right why i don't know you said something curious about people who need to elevate themselves i don't think i was trying to elevate myself and but no, nor, i don't think that you do nor do i think i was hiding funnily enough do you know what I really liked? I like that part of my neck. No, it's a pretty good part of your neck, yeah. And I quite like my ear. No, yeah, no, that's all good. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Down like where your your shoulder meets the mirror, is that bump from like a tank top or is that a bump that's like in the edge of the mirror somehow? Probably from my clothes. Yeah, whatever you're wearing. Yeah. Okay. Um, I like that the line lined up. Yeah, no, yeah, it, it smooths into it, yeah. I mean, listen, you have good angles, it's good light, like it's, 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 it's a dramatic picture and it totally works. Um, is there a reason why you tend not to like to show your face in your own images? I love having my photograph taken, you. Yeah but you don't like to take it yourself. You say that, but I don't see a lot of pictures of you by other people that I've ever seen. Maybe nobody wants to take my picture, Bill. Well, this is, you know, quarantine's almost over. You're going to get your shot soon. Let's, uh, I'll get my new camera. Let's go. No, but just subjects. Say, you know, uh, there, we have spoken about this before, maybe not on camera. If you're somebody who's known for taking photographs, at any yes. family gathering, at any event. You're the one taking the photographs. You're taking the photographs. Yeah. 
And and also, I know this is so unpopular. And this why, is, by the way, I never bring a camera to a family event. But you know, it, this is not um, to shame myself or to victimize myself. But also, maybe it's just that nobody really wants to take my picture. You know, that's like. <gasps> you think I, that's true? I I don't know, but you are right. There's not there's not that many photographs of me. Um. Not that there should necessarily be, but, you know, there are a handful of images like this. I think there's a couple more on your feed where it's like bits and pieces of like the edge or ghost of you, you know, rather than you. And no, I'm not going to say, uh, I think that there is, uh, yeah, I just, do you see it as an artistic decision to do that? Or are you actively don't want to show your face in that way? I guess is my question. Like, do you think it looks better without your face in there? Or is it because you don't want to show your face? I don't mind showing my face. I mean, people who watch this show know that I show my face all the time on YouTube. For hours, talking hours to me and 12 other people. Yeah, a week. <laughs> Um, I, I'm just going to say something and I know this is now like a public forum and people will probably be mean about me by, for saying this but a few years ago um, I wrote I wrote a novel a long time ago actually and I gave it to a friend to read and he got back to me and he said you know it's, it's good Anyway, I sent it off. I just got rejection letter after rejection letter and it became really, really time consuming and demoralizing. I was demoralized. Yep. And I went back to the friend and I said to him, do you know, it's just not getting anywhere. He's like, I tell you what's going to work out, Sandy, just take a photograph and send it with it. Interesting. And it was, that was the most depressing thing that you thought that like, oh, it, that, that, they, you th that they think that it's a superficial thing that like, oh, it's an attractive woman who's writing this novel, therefore we're more likely to say yes. Yeah, that there was a kind of implication that, you know, I was pretty rubbish at this thing that I felt so proud of. You, you, but, you, know, you could take it that way. You could also take it as in the same way we've said a billion times, you know, the business of art is, has nothing to do with art. I don't know. I mean, I think uh, you and I both are lucky because we've got nice faces. We've got friendly faces, maybe. Yeah. Um, and in part, that's because we put our personality on our face. But it's also, okay. again, this idea of happy accident. You know, I just look like my mum with my dad right. combined. I'm not in charge of it. And so if I'm going to I don't know, commodify myself in some way. I'm yeah. not going to do it through that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's interesting. I have a number of friends. I have a friend um, who's a female photographer and she takes a lot of self-portraits. And she's an attractive woman and she'll like, at times have herself like sort of like chunks of her body nude and, and that kind of stuff. And I always wonder, like, I'm not embarrassed with the way I look, but I don't think that I'm one of those people who's, you know, stand out attractive in still photos that some random person sees. And so when I think about being somebody who is like this friend of mine, like, I wonder if she sees it that way or if she just, you know, if she sees it as, well, I look good in pictures, so I might as well take pictures of myself. Or if she doesn't even think like that, because I feel like I would think like that if I were that kind of person, you know, I would feel weird about doing it. You know, but there's also a whole element of this photo where it, this person is hiding in some way, you know. And yet I wasn't. 
Yeah, but you could see. Could you see how how a viewer could see, could feel that way? By the way, lo love love the filter used on this one. The 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 the, the blues and the shadows and the yellows and the highlights. I, I mean, I, I obviously, I don't want to say what other people see in this. You're telling me what you see in it. Um, and I can say what I see it, it as, and I can say that truthfully, I'm quite distracted by what to me was the wondrousness of the line meeting. Um, yeah. In that really formal way, don't forget that like I, and again, you've seen my photographs. So I really do love kind of clean, mind formalism you sure. know in in my more recent work it's very uh disrupted sometimes by lots of other detail but ultimately i think at some point i may even have fancied myself as a kind of minimalist in some way it, you know isn't it fight it's harder it's harder to make sense of one's own work for other people is that our job? Well, this evening it is. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, you and I are friends and we're talking about this like in an intimate way, but you know, in the same way that my explanation of that picture of the people at the cafe is very different than the way that you saw it at, from a, I'm glad that you saw it at that level. And that's the level that I was going for ideally I just think I failed at getting there. The fact that you saw that stuff in there is great. But had I had I explained it to you, had you shown that image and you said, what were you thinking when you made this? And I told you all that stuff. Maybe you wouldn't have thought that way about it anymore because I would have ruined it by whatever st was stuck in my head when I made it. But, you know, with you and the way you work mostly, there is an element of, yes, you're saying happy accident, but actually there is an element of you investing in the setup of something and planning, sure. right? Whereas for me, I'm, you know, you're talking to me about cameras and I'm like, yeah, C3P1, R2D2, and that's it. That That's like the sound you make to me when you talk about technical camera stuff, truthfully. I, uh, I understand. It, it's not a world that I, I'm not interested in it. Yep. Uh, that sounds incredibly stupid of me. Uh, but, you know, I'm making photographs that aren't with fancy cameras. I'm making photographs in places that I do go to with an idea that I will like to photograph there. And like I said, I mean, I do spend a lot of time anyway, obviously in art galleries. I'm there as a matter of personal interest. I'm there on school trips when we take the kids and it's not a pandemic. Uh, you know, I'm in the library. I like libraries anyway. The fact that then I photograph them or that I go places where there might be the opportunity to take pictures, there's nothing with me to falsely light somewhere or to control it or bend it to my will. Yeah. Um. And so because of that, I wonder, you know, I'm so much when I talk about all this meaning. But truthfully, you know, how much meaning is there in my work? As it, as, you know, it's an inceptive moment. And there's sort actually of, very little. Yeah, the, it's sort of the happy accident thing. I mean, the fact that that guy was even there in that picture with the yellow. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I knew I was probably going to make some photographs in that exhibition. But I had no sense of, I mean, it's usually a given that I like some kind of wall. In fact, when I was on my degree, you know, they used to roll their eyes and here comes Sandy with yet another corner or white wall or, <laughs> um, and it is banal to so many people. It's, it's far too boring for, yeah. for so many people, what I do. And yet I find it really endlessly fascinating what these spaces are like what they sound I, like the fact that you're romantic is not a surprise you know uh i mean i think that's that's your superpower to a large extent um well, definitely watched that agnes tote emerson um video earlier you can hear all the language coming out again now bill <laughs> uh by the way everyone should go watch that one that was really good
Oh, um, she's amazing. She's so lovely. There's actually something I was going to ask you about. Oh, by the way, I, I would like to say, though, that um, when I reference like a particular camera or piece of gear, I am not fetishizing them for what they are. I will fetishize them for what I think they the tool can allow me to get closer to what I imagine in my head. Does that make sense? You know, again, I find this so interesting with you. It's like things that you imagine in your head beforehand. Uh, yeah. There's like a pre-visualization of what you make. Yeah, I want it to be good. Oh, okay. So, but there is a, I would say from everything you've told me, told us, um, that you have the plan, you have a, a concept um, and that the concept actually has its own building blocks in your mind. You're building the image from the inside of you out. Yeah, but you know, there, there's a, the reason I do that is because I, if you gave me a phone and put me at MoMA and let me take pictures, I don't think I'd be as good as other people at actually taking photos that way. That I need the preparation and the craft and the equipment in order to elevate what I otherwise see as a pretty mundane artistic ability. Um, it's like I can, I, it's, it's my force multiplier, you know, because without it, I don't think my eye and my ideas are that good. So I, I have wait. to fluff them up with wait, 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 technical expertise. I have to do this. Like my mom always used to say to me, Sandy, comparisons are odious. But if we are to compare and to compare each other for a second, yep. I would say many more people would be able to make this photograph than many more people would be able to make this. You know, yeah, but I couldn't make the picture that your picture. Come on now. I mean, I'm honestly like not good at that kind of picture. And I see other people, the pictures that other people can do with nothing. And I feel like if, if I try to make with nothing, with, you know, this say, mm. um, that I will get lost in the noise. And that the only way that I can be noticed is by, I mean, granted, I, I like having technical expertise. I, I enjoy the figuring things out and the numbers and the structure of all of that. Um, but really it's, it's a little bit of a mask. It's a little bit of a, uh, an armor that I can put on um, that lets me, you know, it's, 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 it's padding that lets me get further up field as a sports metaphor, you know, um, because I'm really not that fast. So it, I look, I, and I'm not, I'm not trying to denigrate myself or like, I'm not, I'm not doing that for effect. It really is the reality of it. Um, and so when I look at a picture like this and I think it, yeah, I think it's neat. Mm -hmm. I think it could be better. And then there's part of me that goes, see, even with the fancy gear and all the thought, you're still make something that's crap. Oh like, my that's, God. that's how my head plays out all the time, constantly. I might actually have to stop the interview and come off air and swear at you a bit, Bill Woodman. <laughs> come there on. are very few images that I've ever made that I'm 100% proud of. A handful, maybe. See, you know, I, I don't know if this is just because I'm a conceited, stuck-up little brat. But I do love this image. It's a good image. And, you know, I do love this image. Yeah. And I don't feel... I don't feel self-conscious about them. I know, which is, again, your superpower. I mean, some people just say that woman is mad <laughs> to say that about those photographs, but how on earth can you feel self-conscious? I wonder if it's like that, there's like a thing, isn't there, about, you know, the more you put into something, the higher, you know, the higher you climb, the higher, you, longer you've got to fall or all those silly. I'm stuff. also, you know, in, a, in the craziness of it, though, is that I'm not comparing myself against other photographers. In this case, I'm comparing myself against one of the greatest painters of all time. No, you're, you're also comparing yourself to now. You're comparing yourself. and True. 
hard time against yourself. But even the picture I took last week, I will look at it and say, shoot, I could have done that better. I should have moved her over here. I should have had this. I should have lit it this way. I should have used less fill light on this side. I'm constantly doing that. And when it, the thing about my job, especially when I'm working with people, is that I generally don't have unlimited time, right? There's some, there's time pressure of the attention of the subject, the time of day, the amount of when they have to leave, you know, whatever, whatever the limitations are, the amount of light I have, the the, you know, whatever the things that I have to work within. And when I'm in the time crunch thing, I'm always kicking myself after the fact because I feel like I could have done something better. So part of the planning is let me figure out, let me make as many of the unknowns known now because I know there's going to be unknowns I have no control over when I get there. And if there's too many unknowns, I could completely fail and then I will get nothing and then I will be a loser and no one will ever hire me again. A self-conscious image of a self-conscious person then. Yep. There's me. There, there's, there's, if I close my eyes and I'm talking like that, that's what I feel like inside. It really is truly you. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. Just as you are trapped in a mirror. Because of my extraordinary vanity. Well, you got a good neckline. Yeah, but, but it is, but it is, but isn't it interesting though that in a lot of images of you, if you are in the image, you're in there in a mirror, in a reflection. But not visible, particularly. No, yeah, yeah, it's like this. It's bits and bobs and pieces and whatever. But that is the way that one usually encounters oneself in a mirror when you're not actually looking for yourself. True, true. But you see it out of the corner of your eye and you say, oh, that's interesting. Let me photograph that in a way that I'm still only partial. I don't know. I mean, Which is could, fine. I, I'm not trying to take the piss out of you. I'm honestly just, you know. You know, we could go super deep with this and say that, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I still need to find myself. Okay. Um, is that a true statement? I don't need the images to be I don't, I don't need them to be about me to be about me. Yeah, I think also that to some extent in the same way that you had your own little world about the image of the man in the suit, you have your own little world about how you see yourself even in a partial image like this. Why do you diminish my world, Phil? I'm not diminishing your world. I think your world is like a TARDIS. It's bigger on the inside. Not a Doctor Who fan. Never sure where the barb is. Well. There's no barb at all there. <laughs> By the way, Tom Baker, best one, fourth Doctor. Such a nerd. <laughs> Bill Wadman, I have no idea how this experiment has gone. I don't think it's quite the way I'd imagined it to be. Only our comments and Twitter threads will We'll know for sure. Well, uh, I'm going to enjoy not wearing a check shirt. But I did get it. <laughs> I did get it are, you, on. are you going? Are you going? Wait. Are you going to wear it uh, ever again? No. You going to give it to your family to wear in the chicken I'm coop? My, I'm going to give it to my brother in a minute. He came and he was like, "Oh, I really like your shirt." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you can have it, no problemo." Oh, that's funny. By the way, in this picture, the red sign behind Derek's open mouth drives me up a wall. It's distracting. Kind of looks like he's holding it. Yeah, yeah. See this. Although, then again, you know what? In a lot of Caravaggio things, there's weird sort of optical illusion kind of things like that too. So, right. Thank you, Sandy. Bye. I mean, thank you, Bill. Oh, thank you. Yep, thank you, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs>